My name is Eleanor Alberga. I'm a composer. I was born in Jamaica and later came to the UK to study music, starting with piano and then later moving on to composition. I now live permanently in the UK in the countryside, Herefordshire. I am an only child and my mother ran a school. She founded her own high school in Jamaica. And because of this and living on the premises of the high school, I very early on was introduced to classical music because she believed very much in the arts. And so I heard these piano lessons going on at her school. And apparently she told me that at the age of five, I asked to have piano lessons. So that's how it started. Meanwhile, I was listening to everything on the radio. There was pop music, there was folk music, there was jazz, there was classical music. And uh, quite early on, my parents started taking me to classical concerts as well. So I decided from about the time I started learning music that I wanted to be a concert pianist. I knew I wanted to be a musician from that early stage. Um, the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music used to, or still do, I believe, go to the West Indies and have exams each year. So I went all the way through the syllabus and that's how I was introduced to the UK and the possibility of studying here. And in fact, I won the biannual scholarship that they offered to the West Indies for piano and came to the academy to study. The house that we lived in uh, since I was about age nine or 10 was next door to the Jamaica School of Music. So I used to pop next door to have piano lessons, to have singing lessons, um, to have clarinet lessons, which went very badly, and I eventually gave it up completely. But so I was next door to this sort of Jamaican music academy. And around the same time, at about the age of 15 or so, I was invited to join the Jamaican folk singers. I'd learned to play the guitar by ear and I accompanied them and sometimes sang with them as well. While I was taking piano lessons, I uh, got to about the age of 12. I loved all sorts of music, but I had a great passion suddenly for this composer I came across at about the age of 12, and that was Bartok, the first composer I really fell madly in love with. I'm sure he still has some influence on my writing. So influences as a child studying music in Jamaica, there were many. There was uh, the rich pop music of Jamaica, which, which had started pretty early on with ska and reggae. And Jamaica is one of these places where if you go there now or several years ago when we used to visit quite often, the pop music would be almost 100% Jamaican. It would be all Jamaican music. So that was a very rich part of cultural sound that was going on. Then there was a folk music I was exposed to from playing with the folk singers and hearing it around. Um, together with all the classical music from Bach all the way to, at that time, not so much absolutely contemporary music, but certainly 20th century composers, uh, Prokofiev, um, Messiaen, and of course, particularly Bartok that, that I took to. Uh, the Romantic School, as a pianist actually, I didn't really get into the Romantic School at that age. I was more of a classical player, so I was into my Beethoven and 
that sort of thing. Um, but these were all, all the sounds I heard. I had this space because of being an only child and I was left alone to my own devices quite a lot. So I used to make up fantasy worlds, being be in the back garden all on my own after the children had gone home from school and uh, find my own sort of worlds and sounds completely on my own. So <laughs> that might have fed into my later life as a composer. So the first piece I can remember writing was about one of my dogs. So I think nature has quite a role in uh, my inspiration or, or ideas for writing sometimes. And the first piece was about one of my dogs. I didn't actually write this down, so I can't remember it much. But the second piece was also about a dog. <laughs> and this piece was called Andy. And that was the first piece I ever wrote down. Um, but everything turned. I played for, I should say, dance classes from early on as well. I was about 16 when I started playing for Madame Sui at her academy. And that was usually set music from books. So I would not quite sight read, but almost play the, the, the music for the, for the set dance uh, exercises. But later on, when I came to the UK, I came across the place and London Contemporary Dance School and London Contemporary Dance Theatre. And I got very excited by this because I was able to improvise for the classes. And it wasn't just improvisation that had to be eight phrases or eight bars long. You could uh, have very uneven counts and the music could be quite strange sounding, if you would call it that. So I really got into improvising for this and uh, the, the pulses and rhythms of the dance exercises excited me as well. And after in, uh, improvising for many classes for London Contemporary Dance Theatre, who I started working for on a full-time basis, uh, some of the choreographers started asking me to, imp to, to write music for their choreography. And this is when, again, I had another very passionate <laughs> uh, event and I fell in love with composing. And that's when everything turned and I started composing more. Now, after winning the scholarship, I studied piano at the Royal Academy of Music and singing as a double first. And I won many prizes at the Academy for piano, uh, the biggest one being the MacFarren Gold Medal. I also was a finalist in the Dudley International piano concerto competition um, but somehow I don't think I was really cut out for a, a career as a concert pianist. It was only later after I had been composing for quite a while with without having a, any teacher apart from the fact I used to come to uh, keyboard harmony lessons here with Richard Stoker and in fact um, I quite often used to bring bits and pieces of what I've been writing. So I could say that he was the first person who, who taught me anything or started encouraging me as a composer. But apart from that, I really had no training. I completely taught myself. Um, and it wasn't until later, when I was already a professional <laughs> composer, I won a Nesta Fellowship and used this to rather than study with, I would say, because I didn't have any two or three year course with any particular person, but I consulted with many of the very well-known composers in this country. Um, for instance, Robert Saxton, Julian Anderson, uh, went to see Harry Bertwistle, um, 
so I had these consultations over a period of two, three years, uh, which which were very helpful. But that that's my history. I was writing before I had been taught. <laughs> I'm always stumped when I'm asked what my music sounds like or what my style is. But I have, I think if we can separate things, I have two things that are there in my life and in my music. One is my Caribbean influence and this has to do with tonality, with rhythms, um, and the other is extreme contemporary European music. And somewhere between these two, my music always uh, grows out, out of these two. Uh, and it depends what the piece is about or, or what I'm writing for, uh, how much Caribbean influence it has and how much European influence it has sometimes, but I think these things are always present to some degree, but the pieces sound different according to the ratio that divides them. And now I have come out of the closet and admitted that I have written some very light pieces that sound very Caribbean or semi-African or maybe a bit jazzy, although I always say I know nothing about jazz, really. I don't know how to play jazz. I don't listen to much jazz. Um, but there are some pieces, for instance, there's Jamaican Medley, which is a solo piano piece made up entirely of Jamaican folk songs that I've arranged. And there is Hill and Gully Ride, which the subtitle is a Jamaican landscape, which is all about my memories and my images of what Jamaica is about. And these are completely tonal and uh, some very fast rhythmic movements. There are other pieces, uh, for instance, like the start of my first string quartet, which are very dissonant. It's Actually, this, this particular start is very rhythmic, but in a different way. It's, it's not Caribbean, it's um, European, I think. Um, so there are these uh, disparate elements that I'm constantly working with together to produce my music. I went through a phase of loving minimalism and the phrase went through um, is very apt because um, I don't think I'm a minimalist, although some of my music contains some aspects of minimalism. But I think this is also, I mean, minimalism came from African music, Steve Reich using uh, African rhythms and repetitions and a lot of that part of my music has ostinatas and repetitions. So in a way it it borrows, they borrow from each other these these two things. Um, but yes, that, that influence is there in my music as well. I've written three string quartets relatively early on. They span between 1993 and 2001, I think. Um, and they're quite different in character. Touching on this touches on one of the aspects of how I write because I quite often like to use extra musical ideas. So some other idea than just the notes and, and the material of the music. <laughs> So in the first quartet, I had been to a physics lecture and I learnt about how life came about 
and how everything is made of the same material that we are all made from stardust basically and this excited me no end and also the idea of the energies whizzing about electrons and atoms and all this so um, that idea goes through the whole string quartet the first movement is about all the energies the disparate energies and the energies coming together and going apart and driving off in different directions quite crazy in a way um, the second movement is very still and the image in my in my mind was about stargazing but being weightless at the same time so stargazing from outer space for instance uh, the third movement we come down to earth and it's it has gravity and human rhythms and earthiness Now the second quartet came from a completely different place. No extra musical idea whatsoever. I took all the material for the whole piece from the first bar. There are changes of tempo, but it's in one movement and there's nothing else. Everything came from those first few notes in the first bar. So completely different way of working. Um, then the third quartet, again, is different from both the others. Uh, it's a much longer piece. It's got four movements. And I think it has more suffering in it shall we say it's 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 a different character um again this had no extra musical idea although afterwards i was encouraged to describe what it might be uh, narrating so i came up with some idea about a stream or something but actually in fact it didn't start like that. It was just the notes and working with, with certain pitches and organizing them in different ways. Um, yeah, so there we are. And that, I think it's about 25 minutes long, the third quartet. The first and the third quartets were commissioned by the Magini Quartet. Um, and I'd like to mention here David Angel, who was the second violin in the Magini Quartet. Actually, all his life he spent with the Magini Quartet. That was such an important part for him. And he was a dear and close friend of mine. And I'm sure he had most to do with the, com the first commission anyway coming about. Um, so I'm very grateful th for that and I wrote him some very special and he would have said drat they were difficult um, <laughs> second violin solos um, and this the second string quartet was commissioned by the Smith Quartet my husband Thomas Bowes and I run the Arcadia Festival near where we live and out of this has come doing the recordings of my string quartets. So although the Maginis might have been interested in recording them, unfortunately, dear David passed away. And so we decided to just go ahead and do the recordings. The album of the three string quartets will be available from June 2019. Uh, one of the largest pieces I've written is an opera called Letters of a Love Betrayed. A uh, setting uh, Isabel Allende's short story with the libretto by Donald Sturrock. That was done at the Royal Opera House as a joint commission. 
with Music Theatre Wales and the Royal Opera House. For this piece, I had to have a specific flavour of of South America in, involved, which I tried to weave in. I didn't try, I did weave it into the whole opera. But it also came from, very much from my own way of writing. And it's me, I think. I, I've used one uh, South American folk song, but that's it. Otherwise, I use the style and some of the rhythms and some of the harmonies in, in the way uh, they do, but it was very much my piece. And I felt very close to the main character, Analia, who um, loved solitude and had a wonderful imagination. Well, I'm, I'm not saying I have a wonderful imagination, but I'd like to think that I have some <laughs> something in common with that. Um, and that was a wonderful experience, seeing that put on in a big theatre and seeing the feedback from the audience, actually. Dare I say this, many people were in tears afterwards on several locations that it was done. And I had absolutely wonderful feedback. And to me, that's what composition is about it's reaching people and it having a meaning for them that helps them through life or does something to them that that yes <laughs> how would i describe my identity i find this difficult because really i would like to just say I'm a human being, and that's it. So I have all the qualities of a human being. I think I have a spiritual dimension, a physical dimension, and this connects with dance. Uh, I have a mental dimension, but I'm also a West Indian. I'm a woman. I am mixed blood, but I'm black. I'm tall. I'm a pianist. I'm a composer. I'm an improviser. I write poetry. I like dancing. I like reading. I like Sudoku. I like cry cryptic crosswords. I like watching films. I like watching very trashy TV series. I find that relaxing. I need relaxation to create. I love nature. Walking, parks, trees, sky, most people, food, sleep. I love my dreams. They feed my work. meditation, yoga. I'm British. I'm part Scottish. I'm part African. I'm part Jewish. I am gender free, I hope. <laughs> Do I want people to hear my so-called identities in my music? No. I want them to hear, well, 
my wish is that they hear good music that communicates something human to them. And of course, if they hear Hill and Gully Ride, they'll hear that it's Caribbean. But that's not the first thing. My compositional aesthetic, again, a very difficult thing for me to describe because I think there are so many things. I think the first way I described myself was as a human being. And so my aesthetic comes from every single aspect of the human being I am. So it can be emotional, it can have anger, love, hate, fear. It can be intellectual, although I wouldn't like to judge how intellectual my music is myself, but I sometimes work very uh, detailed to, to get form and structure and to get pieces to hold together. It can be colourful, it can be crazy, it can be still. And I like to think of beauty in my work. Um, but it can also be ugly and brash. It, it covers everything. My process of writing, uh, the work I tend to emphasize and, and think of most, uh, I write in a different way from the lighter work. So the work I've written most of and, and I tend to emphasize. I like to take quite a long time at the beginning of the process to what I call grow ideas or germinate ideas. Um, and I think of, well, actually, first of all, I have to know what the instruments are going to be because that has a, a very strong bearing on, on the sounds I'm going to get and what I'm going to hear. But I like to spend a long time thinking of the structure, uh, what sort of area of the pitches it's, it's going to have. And only towards the end, this is away from any musical instrument. Uh, it might be while I'm walking or while I'm lying in bed or while I'm watching television or, you know, anywhere but at a musical instrument working. And then not until um, the ideas gather do I then start thinking about what actual material, the actual pitches I'm going to work with and more detail about the textures and the sounds I'm going to work with. And then at the very end, um, I might start writing ideas on a manuscript or I'd go to the piano and try those out and see how they work. And then a lot of the compositional process, it just goes on all day. I wake up having heard something in my sleep and I, rush to write it down if I possibly can or I take take notes about it and I just keep hearing the piece developing and most of the time it, it does fit into the original structure or form I had in mind but sometimes it doesn't and sometimes if it's very strong I have to go with what it's telling me so I might change the structure. So that's that way the other way is when I'm writing the lighter pieces and I just start perhaps, this is one way of doing it, I might start with having an idea for an ostinato, 
So I just keep repeating that ostinato and then I start improvising on the top of that, what, what's happening. And then I take those ideas and I start working them into the piece. Any obstacles to my career? Uh, I think I sometimes think I see these from uh, a reflection, as it were. Because if someone comes up to me and we're talking, I've just been introduced to them and I say, I'm, you know, what do you do? I'm a composer. Oh, do you write jazz? So immediately I think, now that must have something to do with the fact that I'm black. Um, and then I've even had an experience where some people, having found that I was a composer, uh, told me these stories about, I won't name any names, another woman composer who had written some music years before and they actually said of course women shouldn't be writing music she shouldn't have written anything so one again guesses that perhaps there's something with obstacles to do with being a woman now I think that is changing and has changed a lot but I still think there's some way to go. And I think one of the biggest problems is that quite often this is an unconscious prejudice on other people's part. And sometimes the people who think they're being kindest and most liberal, in fact, are <laughs> the people <laughs> who are upholding these biases because they don't realize they have them that out of the goodness of their hearts etc 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 dot 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 another obstacle that i think uh is there in the background for me a lot is the fact that i was mostly self-taught as a composer i started writing before i realized I had started writing. Um, I had no role models as I was growing up, so it didn't occur to me that I could be a composer. And in the background, as I said, um, I quite often think, oh, if only I had thought of it at the age of 10 or something, and I had studied composition, some of the doubts that I have when I'm writing would not appear and would not you know, get in the way and I wouldn't need to find my way swimming through them to get to the other side and work. So that that's another obstacle for me. I'm crap at PR and networking. So I think I, I have to rely on other people to help me with that. And I'm sure I've missed many opportunities through not coming forward, not being extrovert enough and wanting to mix with people and talk about my work and say how marvelous it is. I find that very uncomfortable. <laughs> I made a decision after a short while, after coming to the UK, um, that I would not allow any form of what I might perceive as racism to touch me in any way, that I would just ignore it. And I, I still, I really do think that's a problem in the world. That's their problem. That's a problem of history. That's a problem of slavery. And that that's how people still sort of get a, a splinter of that and, and look at look at black people in a different way but I don't want to put that on myself. Do I feel pigeonholed? I think 80% or 90% of the answer has to be yes. 
I've had many experiences throughout my career, starting early um, with being told, um, of course you write jazz, don't you? So we'll get you a commission with this jazz group. Um, I wrote out a piano part and then the pianist asked me if I could put chord symbols in um, to make it easier. <laughs> For me, that would have made it harder. Uh, so that's just one example, but definitely. So it, it depends on the reason I'm asked and actually the circumstances around the commission, who is asking me and why. I've written pieces uh, for black culture because it's a celebration of either Jamaica or the West Indies or black culture in general. And there was, there was one uh, event where I chose to set, no, I didn't set words, but I chose to use Pushkin as an inspiration for a piece I wrote because he was a black poet and one of Russia's highest thought of poets, so that was great. I have turned down a few opportunities and a few commissions for writing music because I was black, but I've also accepted others. And uh, for some of these, I have written a Caribbean sounding piece because I love doing that anyway, and I would do that given that opportunity or not. Um, but as I say, in other cases, I have turned things down. Um, and if I'm asked to, to write something, I don't think of what the expectation is if, if I'm not given that. I write what I want to write. And what I'm trying to do is to reach people. I keep going back to this word as a human being, not as any ethnic or particular gender class. To introduce myself to someone as a composer, I would say to factor in all the aspects of, of what I do, I would suggest a piece called Succubus Moon, which for want of a better word, <laughs> contain some of my more serious ideas as a composer. And I'd also say uh, the Roald Dahl, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which I set to music. There are dances in their music suites without any words as well. And this, because that has a lot to do with my lighter side of music, mostly, and it also introduces my orchestration. It's written for large orchestra, and that's one of the canvases I really love to work with. And also for easy access, I would suggest Three Day Mix, which is a piece for piano duet. It's about nine minutes long, and it very much has that uh, Caribbean flavor to it.